David Blackburn in, in a lifetime. So. Bom dia. Good morning. So let me first start with uh, an announcement. Let me make it in English. I'm sure everybody will understand. I was told that uh, sometimes objects are being left behind, probably out of excitement of the very good talks you leave. So there is a room, 210, where you can go find whatever you have lost here. So it's not lost. It's in room 210. So. Okay, so um, it was really a great, great pleasure for me, honor to introduce Professor Percy Diaconis, which is a, a Mary Sanceri, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right, for Mary, Mary Sanceri, Professor of Statistics and Mathematics at Stanford um, University. Professor Diaconis has a wonderful and very colorful trajectory in his life as a student and including being a professional magician, among many other things. So this is absolutely fantastic. He uh, was a graduate student, graduated from Stanford, uh, from Harvard University, and has a great list of honors and prizes. I'll, lead, I'll read a few of them, which are quite remarkable. He was in 1982 uh, MacArthur Fellowship, which all you know, it's a very, very prestigious uh, grant for very creative people. He was at ICM both an invited speaker and a plenary speaker at different times, member of the National Academy of Science as of 95, a Gibbs lecturer at AMS, a fellow of AMS, and a member of the American Philosophical Society, among others. So you can see this wonderful trajectory and achievements by Professor Percy Diaconis. So, Without any further ado, let me invite Professor Diaconis to come present this talk, and I have a little souvenir that we're giving to all our invited thank, speakers. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Hi. Um, so this is my first theorem of the day is a no free lunch theorem. Andre, there's no free lunch. You have to make sure that everybody in the room gets one of these pieces of paper, but I'm going to give some to Paolo for one side, so he, he can do one side and you can do the other. And, uh, I am very honored to be the TA for this <laughs> lecture. So there's, there's a handout for this talk. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to give a blackboard talk, and if I'm not writing loudly enough, brightly enough, you should yell out and I'll try to write bigger. Um, so the title of the talk is um, Shuffling Cards and Random Matrix Theory. And, um, uh, uh, and uh, so I have spent a long time thinking about mixing things up. And, uh, and let me start at the beginning with shuffling. Um, so shuffling is, I mean by shuffling probably what you mean by shuffling. You have a deck of cards, you cut it about in half, and you go like that, and then they mix together. And you do that a few times, and, and everybody shuffles cards, and many, many people shuffle cards. And then we ask questions like, how many times do you have to shuffle to mix cards up? And if they're not shuffled enough, why aren't they random? And how can you take advantage of it in a casino or among your friends? Or uh, and uh, so that's the kind of uh, question that we ask about shuffling. And there's um, to make mathematics out of that, um, uh, uh, so Um, uh, I have um, n cards, and um, so you cut off, you cut them about in half, and um, uh, you cut off c with probability n to c over 2 to the n. That, that's the discrete version of the bell-shaped curve. So you cut the cards about in half. And then you start dropping them with your thumbs according to the following um, uh, ritual <laughs> mathematics. Uh, if this is your left hand and this is your right hand, and if you have A cards in your left hand and B cards in your right hand, uh, the chance the next from 
left is A over A plus B. So you, you know, cut the cards, suppose you cut them exactly in half to start with, half the time you drop a card from here, and then uh, the chance that you drop the next card from here is 25 over 51, and so it's a little less likely, and so, the, okay. So um, that's a pretty natural model for the way real people shuffle real cards. Um, uh, and, and the reason I know that is I ask people to shuffle cards and I watch. It's not a good model for the way I shuffle cards or Vegas dealers shuffle. I shuffle practically perfectly, one, 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 one. And um, of course, that's not such a good way of shuffling because if you do it eight times, the cards come back to where they started. Okay, so neat shuffling, neat. Shuffling isn't a good way to mix things up. This is provably the maximum entropy method model for shuffling, and any theorems you prove in this model hold for any other uh, model of shuffling. Anyway, it's a, it's a well-posed description of shuffling. That's shuffling once. Um, shuffle So if Q of sigma um, is equal to the chance of sigma after one shuffle, Okay, so we'll, we'll have other recipes for that, but just can figure it out. Uh, then um, Q star Q of sigma uh, is equal to the sum over eta of uh, Q of eta, uh, Q of sigma eta inverse. So um, everything is sigma and eta permutations. Um, so the chance of being at the permutation sigma after shuffling twice, well, you had to have done something your first shuffle and chosen the shuffle which takes you to sigma the second time. So that's convolution. And then similarly, we have um, Q star K of sigma, the chance of being at sigma after K, after K shuffles. And, um, uh, and it's... The first theorem in shuffling was proved by Poincaré around 1890, and, um, uh, uh, which says that uh, Q star K uh, of sigma converges to the uniform distribution, which is 1 over n factorial. And of course, you all knew that theorem. It says if you shuffle cards a lot, they get all mixed up. Yes, yes. Um, and um, so, um, Uh, okay, so before launching, I'm going to do some mathematics, I promise. Um, um, but there's a question that we don't hear asked so often, um, and let me ask it right now. Okay. Um, you know, okay. Um, and, uh, well, let me offer a few answers to that question. The, the first thing is um, people really do shuffle cards. They actually do care about, about how many times to shuffle. They change the laws in Las Vegas based on the theorem that we prove. Okay, so you know, whatever that <laughs> means, it's true. And uh, it's also going to be on my tombstone. You know, seven shuffles suffice. So, uh, um, so in that sense, you know, that's, I, so some people care. So, okay, people really do shuffle cards. Uh, It's not completely made up. Um, the second reason that it's worth studying this kind of thing carefully um, is that uh, uh, Markov chains, uh, Markov chains. Um, so every area of scientific inquiry um, uses simulation. How many bank tellers should we have? How many planes should we send on a mission? Every area of scientific in inquiry uses simulation. And one of the main tools in simulation is Markov chains. And shuffling is a simple but still realistic Markov chain. And we want to know how long to run our algorithms until they've done their job. And those are hard problems for real algorithms. And so seeing what a neat problem does maybe can give you insight into, into real problems. And of course, there are many, many people here who are study rates of convergence of Markov chains. And so that's a second reason for taking examples uh, seriously. 
The third uh, answer to who cares is the math is nice. Um, uh, and uh, so, um, uh, and I'm going to take the excuse of being at one of the great math institutes uh, in the world, IMPA, right now, and um, I do a lot of talking about shuffling to anybody who will listen, uh, but mostly they can't, <laughs> and, uh, and you can. So um, I'm going to try to tell you some of the connections between this simple model of shuffling and higher mathematics, some other areas of mathematics, which maybe will, will be surprising. The title of the talk was Shuffling Cards and Random Matrix Theory, so something, something different is coming. But shuffling connects to all kinds of different things. Um, but because I'm an IMPA, let me um, uh, at least tell you this. So I described shuffling by this description. Here's a different description of shuffling. Um, uh, there's a map called the Baker's Transformation. And I'm just going to say it this way. You take the unit interval. There's the unit interval. Here's 0. Here's 1. You put endpoints down at random. OK, there they are. Label them left to right, x1, x2, up to xn. OK. And now do the Baker's map, which is um, x goes into uh, twice x mod 1, uh, the world's simplest toral automorphism. Um, uh, so what does that do to the points? Well, there are a binomial number of points in the left-hand half, right? The number of points in the left-hand half has that binomial distribution. There are a binomial number of points in the right-hand half. The points in the left half spread out to twice, right? X goes to twice X. The points in the right half spread out, and the points shuffle together. Yeah? You can, yeah, okay. That's exactly the same model. Not approximately, not. It's exactly the same model. So studying iterates of, of the Baker's transformation is another way of, uh, of uh, saying what I'm doing if that story interests you. Um, and uh, once you've seen that connection, and it's a good connection to have seen, it's very natural to think about an A shuffle. Um, which is just x goes into ax mod 1. So suppose a was 3, um, so what would I do? The same start, but then um, so the left, third of the left third of the dots spreads out, the middle third spreads out, the right third spreads out, and the 3. So what is that with cards? Well, I have a deck of cards. I cut it into three piles according to a trinomial distribution. And then I start dropping the cards with my three hands um, with probability proportional to packet size, the same model. And that's the same, that's the same model. Um, uh, so uh, and so in, in, in general, um, we have uh, a notion of A shuffles. And from this geometric um, distribution, um, you can see the following. Um, uh, an A shuffle. Okay, followed by a B shuffle is an AB shuffle. X goes to AX mod 1, goes to BX mod 1. It's the same as X goes to AB mod 1. It's just not, I didn't do anything. I mean, that's not so easy to prove from formulas, but it's, anyway, it's, it's true. I mean, it's true many different ways of, of seeing it, saying it, but it's very clear from this geometric in interpretation. I care about iterating two shuffles. So what that means is that uh, Q star K of a two shuffle um, is equal to uh, a two to the K shuffle. And so it's enough if I understand A shuffles, right? If I understand A shuffles, fine, I'm done, right? And, um, uh, and um, what Dave Beyer and I did uh, in our paper um, uh, is we, f we found a formula. And it was look for small deck sizes on a computer exactly guess, and then prove, I mean, that method. <laughs> and, uh, and here's the formula, um, Q 
sub a of sigma, the chance of being at a permutation uh, after an a shuffle has a pretty simple formula. Um, it's, um, if it's if, especially if I can remember it, uh, it's uh, n plus a minus r, uh, choose n over uh, a to the n. So first of all, whatever that is, it's a simple formula. But whatever it is is funny, because the left hand dep depends on sigma, and the right hand, well, not yet, but it will in a second. Um, so here, r, which is r of sigma, is equal to the number of rising sequences in sigma. And let me just explain that. So you have a permutation. You find card one. There's two under it, three. That four is above three. So the first rising sequence is one, two, three. Take it out. And then there's four, five, six, seven. And so there's a second rising sequence. So you can decompose a permutation in a unique way as a disjoint union of rising sequences. Is that OK? I mean, it's not so bad. And that's what. Uh, that's what R is. And if you know some combinatorics, uh, it's also true that this is equal to the number of descents in the permutation uh, in the inverse of the permutation plus one. And so descents are more familiar. The Eulerian numbers count the number of descents, and they've been studied for 300 years. And, and uh, so, so the yes and no, good and bad. So it's a beautiful formula for the chance of, of, of shuffling. And, um, and uh, so, on the other hand, this is that makes this an integrable model. It's an exactly solvable model. You know, there's a, a miracle occurred, and there it is. Um, uh, okay, so from that, let me bring this little introduction to shuffling to a close. We can answer the question. So let me answer the question two different ways. Um, first, when um, so theorem. Um, this is from the work with Bayer. Um, uh, so first, um, here's uh, k, the number of shuffles, and here's the distance um, of shuffling to uniform. And um, uh, I better write that down. I will in a second. Um, let me write it down here. The distance uh, of uh, q star k to uniform uh, is the total variation distance, the one we often use when we can, uh, and it's the maximum uh, over A uh, in Sn of uh, the chance of being in A uh, minus U of A. Um, and uh, so A is a set of permutations, like all permutations where the ace of spades is in the top half. And Q star K of A is what's the chance if you shuffle a deck of cards k times that the ace of spades is in the top half. And u of a is what's the chance if you shuffle the cards randomly, and you take the difference between those two numbers, and then you take the worst case. That's this notion of distance. So this is the difference between two numbers which are between 0 and 1. So the distance is between 0 and 1. And um, so uh, here's k is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. OK. So after one shuffle, um, the distance is look, no notes. I just OK. Uh, now, this number is actually 0.99999. I think there are 11 nines. And I know them because I have a formula. I know it, I know it, you know, I know it uh, 70 places of. It's, they're rational numbers, and I know them. Um, uh, and then it starts to cut down. This is 0.924. This is 0.64. This is 0.32. This is 0.16. And OK, then they start going down. And uh, if you drew a, OK. And then they go down by a factor of 2 each time. And that keeps going forever. So how many times do you have to shuffle a deck of cards to mix it up? Well, you know. The way we do it in math is, given an epsilon bigger than 0, how large should k be so that the distance between q star k and the uniform is less than epsilon? Do you have to tell me epsilon? OK, but uh, you know, if the national security depends on it, shuffle 11 times. You know, you, you, uh, OK. Um, that's what it looks like when this is when n is 52. That's what people care about. As 
math, uh, here's another form of the theorem, um, uh, which is that the distance of Q star K to uniform uh, is uh, equal to 1 minus twice capital phi of uh, minus 2 minus 2 to the minus C over 4 times the square root of 3 uh, plus big O 1 over root N. And um, where if you shuffle, uh, if K, the number of shuffles, is 3 halves log to the base 2 of N plus C. So let me try to parse that for you, see if I got it right, makes sense. So you know the deck size n. You, you know uh, the number of shuffles, k, and that determines c, c, this is c. That determines c is a function of n and k, so that's, and this c is the same as this c, and if c is large, 2 to the minus c is close to 0. This is the normal distribution function. Phi of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi, integral from minus infinity to x of e to the minus t squared over 2 dt. And uh, the normal distribution function at 0 is a half, and you're multiplying by 2. And so this formula, which is impossible to look at unless you like the normal curve, um, tells you the shape of this cutoff, um, and um, what both of these things say is that if you draw a graph um, uh, where here's uh, one, this is the distance of Q star K to uniform, and here's uh, K, uh, the graph looks like this, and this cutoff uh, happens at 3 halves log to the base 2 of n. It goes to 0 exponentially fast, and and, and it goes to 1 doubly exponentially fast if C is negative. And so there's a fairly sharp phase transition at, um, uh, at, 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 at uh, 3 halves log to the base 2 of n. And these numbers are from exact computation. And you know the, this shows that the asymptotics work pretty well and so forth. So that's a little bit, um, that's a little bit about, about uh, Shuffling and uh, and you know given that we have a formula, it's, you have to like calculus, but a lot of us do, and I personally do. <laughs> so uh, um, so let's just see. Um, uh, so the the next topic um, that I want to get to is um, it's important for various reasons. Um, uh, maybe for some tasks. You know, if you're actually running a simulation, you don't care about all possible questions. This theorem says no matter what subset A you ask, I'm close to uniform. Maybe you only care about the feature that you're interested in. So certain features get, get random faster. And uh, we know almost any natural question, but uh, so let me just tell you a few kinds of things that come out of this math. So features, I call it. Um, so uh, suppose you want to know how many times you have to shuffle to make the original top card random. You don't care about anything else, just the original top card. Okay. That's, so top card uh, log to the base 2 of n. So less, you know, it's only one card less. So log to the base 2 of n. So, you know, four or five shuffles, it depends on n. Um, suppose you want to know how many times do you have to shuffle so that the card on top is random. That's a different question, right? One was to look at the original top card, card labeled one. You shuffle some number of times, it goes someplace, and you want it to be uniform. The second is you look at the card that's currently on top. You want that to have a random label. Is it the same? No. <laughs> uh, so it's a half log to the base 2 of n. Uh, so f fewer shuffles. Um, so any reasonable feature we probably studied. And I, I, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I've given out references. And we just know a lot more about shuffling than I have time to tell you about. Uh, and of course, you should ask uh, either afterward or I'm here. I came early, and I'm staying late. I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, but the one I want to talk about, because the math is interesting, is 
I, I've written papers about lots of different ways of shuffling. Um, uh, there's the other way of shuffling, which is the overhand shuffle. And then there's smushing cards, where you put cards on the table and go like that and gather them up. And they do shuffle like that in casinos, in California, card rooms, that's the way, in Monte Carlo. That's the way they shuffle cards. And we've made fluid models, thank you, uh, um, uh, which, OK. And so suppose somebody, how would you test a shuffling mechanism. Well, if you don't, you know, suppose it was smushing and then you gather them up. Um, and if you don't smush enough, why wouldn't it be random? Well, a natural thing to do is pick, you know, you know the original order of the cards, say one up to n, and you could pick a natural metric on the permutation group and look at the distance of the current permutation to the starting order and see if, if it's the way a random permutation should be. So, um, let uh, uh, d of you know sigma of the identity be some notion of distance. Um, uh, you know how uh, how far is it um, from if 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 the permutation is random? And I'm just going to tell you about one metric, um, which is so. I claim that Stanford has the world's greatest computer scientist, and it's Don Knuth, um, uh, inventor of tech, but inventor of so many things that I, I'll stop. Um, and Don's favorite metric on permutations is what we call in the business Ulam's distance. Suppose you had a hand of cards, and you wanted to sort them. So you could take a card out, put it in, take another card out, put it in. OK, just, just do that. If you're more mathematical, that you have generators for the symmetric group, which are cycles, all possible cycles. Uh, you know, you take card five out, put it at, at, at nine. That's you know, whatever it is. Five goes to six, goes to seven, goes to nine, goes to six. So use cycles as generators. What's the length of the current permutation? But how many insertion deletion operations does it take? That's a, a popular method of, of, of a metric on, on permutations. And Don thinks it's a great metric. OK, good. So, um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, so I'll use, uh, uh, we use, uh, it's called Ulam's distance. And it's not hard to see, again, the margin of this talk is too narrow to include the proof, but uh, d of sigma identity um, is equal to n minus the, the length of the longest increasing subsequence in the, in the permutation. So you know, if I have an ar arrangement of, of cards, um, uh, you, know, you, you find a, there's a card, and to the right of it is a bigger card and a bigger card. And how, how, what's the length of the longest? sequence that you can make, the length of the longest increasing subsequence. That's, that's a famous functional of, of permutations. And uh, this Ulam distance is n minus the length of the. So if sigma were the identity, uh, the longest increasing subsequence is 1, 2 up to n. And so the distance is 0, right? So, so. Um, so let me make an aside. Um, and uh, this is aside 1. <laughs> Um, suppose the deck. Suppose you have a random permutation. What's how long is the longest increasing subsequence? That's called Ulam's problem, and um, it's one of the great successes of probability theory of the last 20, 30 years. Um, and uh, I'll just tell you the result as a theorem. Um, this is the bike dyfe johansson theorem. Um, so for a random permutation, that is, the cards have been mixed and mixed and mixed, they're random. For sigma uniform in Sn, um, the, look at the length of the longest increasing subsequence, take, call it L of sigma. How big is it? It's around 2 root n. And uh, the, how it, does it fluctuate around 2 root n? It's a little bit funny. It's n to the 1 sixth. You don't see those numbers so classically in probability. The chance that the length of the longest increasing subsequence minus its mean fluctuates, in the chance that that's less than or equal to x, has a limit, f of x. 
Okay, that's the, that's the theorem. And f of x is an interesting f. Um, uh, so f of x, well, see if I <laughs> remember it uh, properly. Uh, it's equal to e to the minus integral from x to infinity of um, t minus x um, uh, times q of x, dq of t, uh, q of t, uh, squared <laughs> uh, dt, where q is a solution of a Pan-Levé II equation. I can write it down. You can ask me afterward. Uh, q is, uh, you know, q double prime is equal to, God knows what it's equal to, um, uh, x, uh, q of x uh, plus 2 q, um, uh, q prime of x squared, something like that. It's one of the classical Pan-Levé transcendents. So it was a, a, a wonderful achievement. And, uh, and this allows you to answer the question, you know, to know if the cards are well shuffled, um, uh, what's the dis how far, you know, how far is a, is a well shuffled deck from its starting position? Um, and uh, uh, so this is a wonderful, some of the deepest mathematics that's been done in probability, and, and it's a, the start of a start of a large world. Um, so what I want to try to tell you about is this theorem, which is about well shuffled cards. It transfers to our model of shuffling to the Gilbert Shannon reads. So there's a, a, a wonderful analog between this theorem and uh, there's a wonderful analog of this theorem for shuffling. And the math is quite interesting. So this was a side one. I'm going to study a metric. We've studied lots of metrics, but I'm only going to tell you about this one. And, um, and uh, now, aside two, as I have to tell you a little bit about representation theory um, of finite groups, and then some bigger groups. Uh, but I hope it's OK. Uh, now, to make sure that I don't, no, I'm, I seem to be doing OK. Um, so this is aside two. Um, so let G be a finite group. Like the permutation group, but it could be any old group. And a representation is a map row from G into matrices, uh, GL some D sub row of, say, C. Um, so which, you know, such that the product of two group elements is equal to the product of the two matrices, rho of t. And uh, some stage you learn that, uh, that representations can be built out of irreducible representations. And um, I'll, I'll let uh, g hat be the irreducible, the ones which can't be decomposed non-trivially, irreducible representations. And um, uh, uh, so, so if you haven't seen it before, uh, everybody knows about sines and cosines. And any signal can be decomposed into sines and cosines. Every group has its analog of sines and cosines. And any group-valued function from the group can be decomposed in, in, in terms of the, of the, of the of the matrix entries of the irreducible representations. Um, and um, uh, I'm, well, one of the facts you learn in the first week of a group theory course is that the order of the group is equal to the sum of um, uh, 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 rho contained in g hat of d sub rho squared. So the sum of squares of the irreducible representations is equal to the order of the group. and um, OK, so um, the, for the symmetric group, um, for Sn, for all permutations, um, Sn hat, the irreducible representations, are indexed by partitions of n uh, is equal to all partitions of n. Uh, 
So for each partition of n, there is associated a natural, useful way, an irreducible representation of the symmetric group, and those are all of them. And so this formula says that n factorial is the sum of the partitions of n. And now I have to cheat slightly, and it's only because I don't have a week. I only have 50 minutes. Um, but um, there's a marvelous thing that we in algebraic combinatorics do. Um, and uh, it's called the uh, robinson shenstead knuth correspondence, RSK, robinson shenstead knuth And that associates to each permutation uh, a pair, uh, P of sigma, Q of sigma, of standard Young tableau Um, uh, of the same shape. OK, so that's a big, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a big leap. And let me at least explain this. So suppose lambda is the, perm is the partition 3 to a partition of 5, right? And a standard Young tableau, um, well, it's a, a way of putting down the numbers 1 to 5, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, 1, 2, 4, uh, 3, 5, uh, one, two, uh, one, two, five, uh, three, four, uh, one, three, four, two, five, one, what am I missing? Uh, one, three, five, two, four. So it's a way of putting the numbers one up to n into the shape lambda here, the shape 3, 2, such that the rows are increasing and the columns are uh, increasing. And um, there are five ways of doing that. And the dimension of the irreducible representation corresponding to the, the partition lambda is the number of standard Young tableau of that shape. Um, and uh, and um, so there are five irreducible representations of S5 corresponding to the partition 3, 2. And um, so what the RSK correspondence does is it associates to a permutation a pair of standard Young tableau of the same shape. Um, and, and what that means is that um, so n factorial this is a, a bijective proof of this in this special case. So the, for every permutation, there's a pair of standard Young tableau of the same shape. And, and so n factorial is the sum of the number of st standard Young ta tableau squared. And uh, the reason I'm telling you about that now, other than it's one of our favorite objects and a wonderful, wonderful part of the world, is that the, um, the number of boxes in the first row of this P, the, the map takes a, a, an arrangement of a deck of cards, and it gives you a shape, a partition lambda, the common shape of P and Q. The number of boxes in the first row is the length of the longest increasing subsequence. Okay, that's, that's why Shenstead invented it. Don Knuth was his office mate. He was working on a sorting algorithm. And Shenstead invented RSK in order to uh, solve a combinatorics problem. And, um, uh, and it's all black magic, but it's beautiful black magic. And um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a little bit of that. But um, what? I'm going to need a little bit of that in, in, in just a second. Um, so um, there is this world of, of, um, uh, of uh, representation theory of the symmetric group or of, of, of groups in general. Um, and it's, uh, let me say one more thing about representations of groups. Uh, re representations can be characterized by their characters. Um, chi sub rho of S is equal to the trace of the matrix rho of S. And uh, characters are enough. Um, and uh, uh, and um, 
it'll be useful for us to have the notion of normalized characters. So I'll write a bar, bar chi sub rho of s bar uh, is equal to chi sub rho of s over chi sub rho of 1. And uh, so normalized characters. And um, here's a, a construction, a useful fact, and then I'll need it in a second. Um, uh, so it's true for any group. Say, say G is a finite group. Um, and um, uh, uh, so chi sub rho bar uh, uh, satisfies uh, 1. Of course, chi sub rho bar of the identity is 1, because you made it be 1. Uh, uh, 2 um, uh, chi bar sub rho of st. It's uh, equal to chi bar sub rho of Ts. It's, it's OK, does that for a living. And the three, uh, property three, is the matrix uh, chi, the normalized characters chi sub rho of S inverse T. Uh, now, this is a G by G matrix over S and T. This matrix is positive um, definite. Uh, and um, so um, th those are easy to check if, if you have a character, um, uh, not even irreducible. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, so people define generalized characters. Uh, let let um, chi be a generalized character uh, if it satisfies 1, 2, and 3. So. That's a definition. Uh, so a function from the group into the uh, complex numbers, um, which, which satisfies those three axioms. And a little theorem, which for finite groups is even not such a trivial thing to prove, but it's, it's true. The, the generalized characters uh, are a com convex simplex. And um, the extreme points are the irreducible characters of the group. That's true for any group, uh, are the irreducible characters, irreducible characters, normalized irreducible characters. So that's a funny way uh, of, of, of saying what the irreducible characters are. Um, and the reason I'm telling it to you this minute is that um, that's the way that people who work on big groups, and we're going to do that in one second, groups that are big groups like S infinity uh, or U infinity or O infinity, they're groups that are not locally compact. They're big groups. Okay, uh, That's the way we define characters of, of big groups, that this way. And uh, uh, that's what. So an irreducible character is, is a, a, it's not irreducible anymore. It's complicated. But an irreducible character of a big group is um, is uh, is a um, is a, uh, is an extreme point of the set of uh, of the set of, uh, of of functions on the group that satisfy these uh, these three properties. And um, so, let me tell you one thing. So the characters of the symmetric group, we know a lot about them. But then we don't know a lot about them. Um, if you want to, so if you give me a partition lambda and you give me a permutation sigma and you ask the question, is chi sub lambda of sigma 0 or not, okay, for the, uh, that, that's sharp p complete. Right. NP, N, yes or no, it's an NP complete in general. That's a little theorem. And uh, so we don't know the characters, really. We know them in the corners. But uh, you know, actually, you know, for, even though we know uh, uh, it's probably true that a, a, a positive proportion of the characters actually zero. <laughs> but we, not, that's not a theorem. That's a conjecture. But um, uh, if you give me an actual character telling whether it's zero or not, you know, we, we don't know that there's no formula. The formulas are very complicated for the characters of the symmetric group. But the characters of S infinity are, um, are uh, beautiful and well understood. And then there's a limit theorem that says that if the characters of Sn 
are well approximated by the characters of S infinity. Um, and uh, um, so I'm going to just tell you Thomas' theorem, given that I've gotten myself this far into this part of the world. And I promise this is all about shuffling cards. So uh, just don't, don't, <laughs> don't lose faith <laughs> yet. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, OK, so here's uh, Thomas' theorem. Um, so uh, the characters, the irreducible characters, in this sense, irreducible characters of S infinity. S infinity is the set of all finitary permutations, permutations which do anything to the first any number of places they like, but then they're, you know, sigma of i is i past some point. So that's, uh, that's, that's the S infinity I'm working with here. Um, um, uh, so we're indexed, indexed. Uh, by pairs, uh, alpha, which is alpha 1 bigger than or equal to alpha 2, uh, and beta, which is beta 1 bigger than or equal to beta 2, bigger than or equal to 0 both times. And uh, summation of alpha i plus beta j is less than or equal to 1. So the irreducible characters are indexed by you know, data, which is uh, labels, alpha and beta. And there's a formula. Um, uh, chi sub alpha and beta uh, of sigma, any permutation, is equal to the product of k equals 2 to infinity of, um, of, uh, of what? Of, uh, of uh, the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of um, uh, alpha i to the k uh, minus uh, no, plus minus one to the k minus one times beta i to the k um, and then to the a uh, i of sigma where um, a i of sigma is the number of i cycles the number of i cycles in in sigma, then, then no fixed points. So, um, so you have a permutation sigma. Of course, it has infinitely many fixed points, but it has some number of transpositions, some number of three cycles, etc. Any permutation can be uniquely decomposed that way. And this is a you know that's a formula for the character, and uh, uh, and uh, it's a it's a beautiful formula. It has a, a beautiful probabilistic proof due to Kirov and Vershik, but Toma did it in the 1940s, much earlier. There are similar theorems and developments for U infinity, O infinity, all the natural, the simpl infinite symplectic group. Um, there are similar developments um, uh, of characters of large, large groups. And um, the, this formula, that's a formula. Um, the, there's a way, given a, given a partition lambda, of, assigning an alpha and beta such that the alpha and beta that you assign the character of, of, uh, of chi lambda of the symmetric group evaluated at sigma is, is within 1 over n of this. So this gives you a way of approximating the, uh, the irreducible characters of the symmetric group. And uh, um, it's, a, it's a very nice development. So once one sees this, um, it's natural to ask, well, all right, what are, what are chi, alpha, and beta in English? Uh, and, uh, um, and so uh, there's a lot of effort in that direction, um, a lot of study. Uh, I put a reference to a beautiful book by uh, Alexei Borodin and Gregor Olshansky, which develops just this for S infinity, if you wanted to learn more about it in the, in the handout. But for example, um, 1 and all zeros, alpha is 1 and all zeros, and uh, all zeros for beta, uh, that's equal to the trivial character. Um, all zeros and 1 and all zeros, that's equal to the sine character. 
um, all zeros, that's equal to the regular, represent, regular character. Okay. So people study what characters this character, 1 half, 1 half, and 0, and all zeros. In order to describe those, you need to know about shuffling. I, I said shuffling is coming. <laughs> We're not so far from shuffling in, 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 in any of this. So, um, uh, uh, so let me tell you a little bit of a generalization. I told you shuffling. I told you A shuffles. OK, put in a few more parameters. Here come X shuffles. Uh, let Xi be given or equal to 0. Summation of Xi equals 1, uh, 1 to infinity. B parameters. Um, uh, drop n balls into infinitely many boxes. Many boxes. Um, where the chance of the, a ball dropping into box i is xi, according to xi, this is probability distribution. And then, um, so you have some configuration of balls and boxes. I'm just, I'm going to say this in the air without writing it down. I'm happy to write it down if you like. Um, so uh, look at the, going from left to right, look at the first non-empty box. Suppose it has balls labeled 1, 3, and 17. OK, take a deck of cards um, in order uh, and um, uh, r remove cards labeled 1, 3, and 17 and put them here. OK, and then look at the second box. It has, you know, 2 and 18 in it. Find cards 2 and 18, take them out and, and put them here. And then just keep doing that, you know, decomposing the, you know, so. Given a configuration of balls and boxes, you can convert that into a permutation by, by doing what I just said. And let me remind you, shuffling is this way. Inverse shuffling is you take some cards out and put them on top. So this thing I'm describing, X shuffling, gives you a way of doing inverse, inverse riffle shuffles. And um, so uh, in particular, um, uh, 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 if uh, x is 1 over a, 1 over a, 1 over a, um, and all zeros past, past that, um, these x shuffles just become my in inverse a shuffles. But uh, you have a deck of cards, flip a coin with probability 1 over a for each card if it comes out. Take all the ones and put them on top, and then all of the twos and put them next, et cetera. So, um, uh, and then um, there's a theorem um, uh, due to Richard Stanley, beautiful theorem, uh, and, and Jason Fullman. Um, do an X shuffle. And get sigma for sigma. Um, then do. RSK, take your permutation and, and convert it into a shape, lambda, by doing the RSK algorithm. Um, the, the Q sub K probability, uh, the Q sub X probability, uh, that you, um, that you uh, get the uh, um, partition lambda that the shape of the partition is lambda, and so that the length of the longest increasing subsequence is the number of boxes in the first row of lambda, is equal to uh, d lambda, which is the dimension, the number of standard Young tableaus, times s lambda of x, um, uh, where s lambda is the sure function. And even I don't have the nerve to try to tell you in the last minute, uh, we're over time actually, sorry, in the last minute what the, um, what the, what the, about symmetric function theory, but you know, there are power sum symmetric functions and all kinds of symmetric functions. And the, the sure functions are great objects of algebraic combinatorics and many other parts of analysis. and um, uh, and. I'm not, and I'm going to stop now, but um, uh, this theorem, uh, if you take x to be the 
alpha and beta, put them all together, um, this theorem gives you a description of what Thoma's characters are. And um, without writing it down further, um, there's a beautiful theorem of Sergei Kirov, which says that um, if you do an A shuffle, uh, and um, so I do an A shuffle. I cut the deck into A piles. I shuffle them all together. Um, and then you look at the length of the longest, you look at the longest increasing subsequence, or the RSK shape. Um, so of course, the longest increasing subsequence is going to be around you know, n over a, and plus a little bit. And, uh, and uh, that the joint distribution of the lengths of the number of boxes in the rows of the RSK algorithm is equal to the, the, the distribution of the eigenvalues of a random Hermitian matrix um, uh, um, uh, that is uh, an, an A by A random Hermitian matrix chosen from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And we know more or less everything about the eigenvalues of random Hermitian matrices. And therefore, we know almost everything about how far are you from random if, uh, in this notion of distance if you don't do enough shuffles? OK, I didn't manage to tell you all I wanted to tell you about, but I did manage to give you a handout. And I put lots of pointers to things that maybe people would be interested in. And I'd love to talk more about it, but now isn't the time. OK, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, questions or comments? Complaints are OK. <laughs> Thanks for the talk, Percy. Uh, yeah, this is not really a question, but it's an opportunity for you to talk a bit more about the random matrices, if you, if you feel like it. <laughs> um, uh, well, the thing I didn't get to say, um, and I, you know, I'm I meant well, um, uh, but you, I couldn't have put more in. Um, let's take the length of the longest increasing subsequence in a random permutation. And I said it's around 2 root n. And then if you divide by n to the 1 6, it has a limiting distribution. That's a theorem. There's another theorem. Pick a random n by n Hermitian matrix that is just fill out the entries according to the bell-shaped curve, and then make it Hermitian, and, and, and uh, pick a random n by n Hermitian matrix. Hermitian matrices have real eigenvalues. Look at the largest eigenvalue of a, of a random Hermitian matrix. That's around 2 root n. The fluctuations are n to the 1 6. The chance that the largest eigenvalue minus, n to the one, minus 2 root n over n to the 1 6 is less than or equal to x is equal to that same f of x. Um, and that's a marvelous fact. And um, for, ye for years, we didn't know, you know, why, why, <laughs> what's the connection between permutations and random matrices? And then Okunkov said, oh, yeah, it's easy. Well, it's easy for him. Uh, and it has to do, there's a third object, which is Riemann surfaces. And, and that it seems to interpolate, it does interpolate between, between the two. But so there is a close understood con connection between length of the longest increasing subsequence and random matrix theory. And I meant to say that earlier. And what I was trying to say here, and I didn't manage to say it, but I did put a reference to Jason's paper in the handout, is this RSK, this Gilbert Shannon Gilbert Reed's measure interpolates that math. And, and I, I find that fascinating. That's, Thank you for giving me an excuse to finish my sentences, Rodrigo, <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Thank you. So let's see. Let me put it this way. The table is, is open. Anybody wants to lay their cards down? <laughs> what? Questions, comments? But I, I am around and happy to discuss slower outside. Um, very good. Well, so thank you very, very much for this very nice, lively talk. <laughs> <laughs>